You've heard me speak about this before if you've been in any of the committees, and I've spoken on the floor back when we changed the law for any adoptions after 1983. I know that this is a very difficult issue. It's an important issue. And I see merit on both sides. We just heard representatives say when he saw the birth mother is such a selfless act, such an incredible selfless act. Well, over the years in this building, think about how many times the women that made that self, selfless t act spoke to you compared to an adoptee or a relative of an adoptee. We're all getting the emails and all. Nobody speaks for those people. Talk about a silent number. And they're all women. Ladies and gentlemen, our members are having difficulty hearing this conversation. So if we could please take our conversations outside. I understand that it is the last day of our legislative session and there are many things going, but if we could please take our conversations outside or lower them to lower them so we can hear our members are having difficulty hearing each other. Thank you so much. Representative, I apologize for the interruption. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I appreciate it. You know, one thing I just want to point out, when I talk about these silent women, mostly women, there are people in this chamber that have said to me, look at, I am really uncomfortable with this bill. I don't want to vote on it. And one of the reasons is, and you'll hear this from other people, we are being attacked on social media, phone calls. There's several of us that have been accused of giving children up for adoption. I mean, this is, this is, I get it's personal, but the way legislators have been treated in this building on this issue, I have never seen in my nine years, ever. And obviously we've had a lot of contentious issues. The women I'm talking about don't have that voice. They're not sending, rarely do they send in emails, but you'll hear about one or two today. We have a program called Safe Haven that we all pr we have pride in. And what is the goal of a Safe Haven? Help the mother and keep the baby alive. That was the goal of the agencies like Catholic Charities 50, 60, 40, 40 years ago. That was the goal, to keep the babies alive and help the mothers. What are we saying to the Safe Haven program? You can drop a baby off on a doorstep and we're never going to come looking for you, but now it's a big issue. These women, people talk about times have changed. Obviously, I'm one of the older ones in this chamber. Times have not changed for these women. This is a, a, something that happened in their lives. They made decisions. And they made a decision to give the baby up for adoption with the agreement that if there ever was a contact, it would be done mutually. And that's what this really is about. It's not about saying to an adoptee, you don't have a right. It's not picking a winner and a loser. It's saying to the adoptee and the biological mother, we're going to do everything possible to bring you together. I just want to read to you briefly. The National Council on Adoption historically has opposed any type of unrestricted, unrestricted access that's being currently proposed in this bill. But today, the organization, 40-year-old organization, says it supports legislation that balances the need of the adult adoptee and the birth parents. They believe that they we could use trained, confidential, inter, inter, I can't say the word intermarries, to discreetly contact birth parents or adoptees and see if they want to reunite. And it leaves open the option for birth parents to decide whether they want to be contacted. We support people who want to be uh, contacted and allow ways to make that happen. And there's a few of us that have been working here to really take our registry that really isn't active enough and build it up. I spoke to Catholic Charities. They really said people don't understand what they go through. Their goal is to reunite these folks. That is their goal. But they, 
Differences here, mutual. You know, I use the word outed. What they're talking about with this bill is outing 80-year-old women. I've said it before. That's the only way to put it. So we appreciate and believe strongly the right thing to do is for these folks to be reunited, but in a way that's humane to everyone. Being put in a position to have to change an 80-year-old or 70-year-old woman's life, times were very different back then. These women, some of them, abortion was illegal. They were getting illegal adoptions, um, abortions. Some of them, unlike today, did not go back to school when they found out they were pregnant, didn't go home, didn't go take their jobs, didn't, life didn't change. They dropped out of school, they looked, left their jobs, they quite often left their families. They did not take the easy way out, they were courageous. And my thought has always been, why would we do this to these people? They didn't take the easy way out. There's no list of names of people who got abortions. And I'm pro-choice and I'm saying that. These are women that did it the hard way because they believed in life. Just the way we do with Safe Haven. The contracts that were signed with these agencies were agreements that both sides committed to. How many times here do we talk about agreements or agreements? We bring up, we've got to do something about the pensions. It's an agreement with the CBAC agreement. We can't touch that. That's a promise. We're talking about a promise here too. There are only four states that have this kind of un unrestricted access. Alabama, Alaska, Maine, and Oregon. And then others have different types of access. But the bottom line, they all have a peace dual consideration. So I ask you today, let's work with both sides of this. And I ask the proponents of the bill, and I don't mean legislators, to please stop attacking us. We just really believe in supporting these women. We want to be a voice for them because no one else is. So thank you very much. I know it's a difficult decision. Times have changed, but I'll tell you what. When you look at the amount of women who have, who have asked or sent letters, it's very few. When you look at the testimonies, 100 people sign up. They have, they have um, lobbyists, they have agencies. This is just when you hear from these, these women, rarely when you hear from them, it's from the heart. And they're terrified, terrified that a decision they made 50 years ago is going to be overturned in their life. They made the decision not to tell their, their children, their husbands. One woman said, you know, I was raped. Nobody in my family knows it. Nobody. I don't want to have to divulge that to anybody. That's her decision. So I do feel that when we don't have a problem with the father's name not being on birth certificates, but this is the big issue, this is attacking women, especially older women. So I thank you for your time. I think this is something we need to continue. We have to work better to get these reunifications. We should unite them, but in a way that's humane. Thank you very much.